Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 31st meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, we have apologies from Willie Coffey. Um, can I remind members to put their mobile phones into at least a, a process that doesn't interfere with proceedings? Uh, the first item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body on its budget sub submission for 2019-20. And we're joined today by Jackson Carlaw, MSP from the Scottish, from the SPCB, obviously. Uh, Sir Paul Grice, the Chief Executive, and Derek Crowe, the Head of Finance and Security, and Michael, Michelle Hegarty, who is the Assistant Chief Executive. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting, and I invite Jackson Corlow, if he wishes, to make a brief opening statement. Uh, a short statement, Convener. Thank you very much. This is the third time I've appeared before the Committee on behalf of the Corporate Body. And last year, I advised the Committee that the Corporate Body's 2018-19 budget submission was set at a level that would provide a sustainable footing for the remainder of the current parliamentary session. Members may recall it included a significant increase at that time. Following extensive planning and prioritisation, I can confirm that this year's budget submission for 2019-20 uh, has been set at a level of the indicative forecast advised to the committee. It remains the case that our medium-term financial plan is a prudent approach to what we can reasonably anticipate, and we retain fle flexibility to reprioritise resources to meet emerging demands. As such, the corporate body total budget submission for revenue and capital expenditure is £90.4 million pounds for 2019-20, which, excluding the one-off office holder relocation costs for the current year, to which we referred last, is a 2.7% increase over the current year. The overall net increase is attributable to inflation. Our Parliament remains busy, and consequently there is a high demand on the services provided by the SPCB. As your committee will appreciate, and I believe this is the euphemism, uh, uncertainty remains around the final outcomes of the Brexit process and the parliamentary impact. Uh, officials continue to actively engage on all developments so that SPCB can be advised of any changes or impacts which must be planned for and managed. And we remain assured that we have invested in the right level of capacity, expertise and support for members. We continue also to develop new ways to provide our services. Uh, which are more efficient and responsive to members' needs. For example, members of the committee may be familiar with the SPICE Spotlight blog, where SPICE staff are publishing information in anticipation of high-profile issues or to quickly react to breaking issues. Subscribers are growing, and although it's still early days, we're hopeful that this will reduce reactive inquiries to enable SPICE to focus the resource onto more specific and complex inquiries. Uh, we are approaching the end of the one-year pay deal for parliamentary staff, and negotiations will commence in the new year to determine a new pay settlement once the corporate body has considered a negotiating remit. MSP pay rises are linked to public sector pay rises in Scotland. Using the annual survey of hours and earnings that is published by the Office for National Statistics, using that index and resisting the temptation when there's no other news that might get reported to omit the decimal point, I can confirm formally that an increase of 2.3% will be applied for April 2019. I would like to pick out three areas of progress based on our last budget submission to the committee. The recommendations arising from the Commission on Reform continue to be considered, with the majority of recommendations to be implemented now over the coming months. We are already seeing the benefit of some of the changes we've resourced, such as the emerging new ideas around public participation to enhance committee work being piloted by the newly established Committee Engagement Unit. The corporate body expect to consider a closure report on the reform agenda in early New Year, and the proposed budget for 2019-20 now reflects the ongoing revenue costs associated with the Commission for Parliamentary Reform. Our project budgets reflect an increasingly mature approach to planning and prioritisation so that we can smooth our expenditure over multiple years. As always, choices have had to be made about project investment informed by our strategy, management of risk, and of course, value for money. Project spend for the next few years reflects, among other things, the need to start to replace various aspects of our infrastructure in terms of broadcasting, facilities and IT, which have been in place in many instances now for 15 years or more. In addition, physical and online security remain paramount considerations of the corporate body, and we are continuing to invest to ensure that the Parliament is welcome, accessible and pr uh, primarily a safe place to work and visit. Uh, the committee will remember that our bid last year included a project to relocate three of the office holders, the Ombudsman, the Children's Commission and the Human Rights Commission. Uh, this has been a significant piece of work this year for the respective office holders and for the corporate body staff, which is now nearing conclusion. Some have already relocated and the final will in January. 
Whilst there are still some outstanding aspects of the project to conclude, we confirm that there will be rental savings in the order of half a million pounds over the 10-year period. And as a result of the co-location, we anticipate further savings and efficiencies through the shade services agenda in the future. And uh, convener, that concludes my remarks in relation to the budget. And myself, uh, I and obviously all colleagues will happily take questions. OK, I, I thank Jackson Carla for that helpful uh, introduction. Uh, in our report on the draft budget in 2017-18 and a report on the draft budget in 2018-19, the committee invited you and the corporate body to consider undertaking a review of corporate body supported office holders. What progress has there been in delivering that review? I think I did say, convener, last year in response to that, that given that we had uh, unquantifiable uh, work to do at that point in relation to implementation, implementing and considering the recommendations of the Commission for Parliamentary Reform, and also because there was considerable additional work we were having to do in the preparation for Brexit, that although the corporate body has discussed a full review, we weren't sure that whether this current year that we've just completed would be the appropriate time to do it, given that we were also involved in quite a lengthy negotiation with the various office holders relating to the relocation, which, of course, some of you will be aware, uh, had a certain public dimension to it, which required quite a lot of uh, considerable effort on the parts of the uh, parliamentary staff. Um, I think it's also worth just noting, because I think this is something the committee might want to consider, um, the government is laying before Parliament legislation to create an additional commissioner, and I know that in session three, uh, the Parliament wrestled with the whole business of the number of parliamentary commissioners that we had, and there was quite a controversial discussion arose in relation to the recommendations that the committee made to Parliament at that time. Uh, I think it is something the committee might want to pursue with interest uh, if whether two parliaments later we maybe are at a point where there is a temptation for a significant increase in the number of commissioners that exist. That's obviously not something for the corporate body. We will have to uh, work with whatever commission structure is applied, uh, but it is a matter, I think, that will be of concern. Should this proposal go ahead, it will lead to uh, a minor additional increase in the first instance on a part-time basis. But this is all speculative. It's in the publicly known uh, anticipation, anticipatory needs, but there's no formal bill yet been laid before us. Yeah, but obviously when the financial memorandum comes uh, with that bill, it's something that this committee will have to give consideration to at that time. Yeah. Um, Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, this last year has been quite uh, busy with additional legislative work that we're starting to see come through committees now. I'm interested in whether we have um, seen more overtime, um, has, how has that impacted parliamentary staff, has flexi time been a challenge? I'm just interested because in our papers it doesn't really like jump out that we've had more hours worked or, or more flexible time. Is, is that something that we're going to see a, a challenge in the future? Yeah, uh, can we answer that in two ways? Firstly, mm -hmm. um, it is the case that uh, at this same point in the current parliament, we are significantly busier than we were at this point in the previous parliament. Uh, the number of uh, committee time uh, year on year, uh, make sure I give you the right figures here, year on year, the increases are uh, from last year, 27% more committee time and 9% more chamber time. Committee meetings are up 22%. Uh, and increases in comparison with the previous session at this point is 19% more committee time and 5% more chamber time, with general committee meeting times up 17%. So you're correct in terms of the overall uh, um, workload of the Parliament. It is proving to be consistently busier in this session than it was in the previous session, and Paul will address with you the specific requirements in relation to the costs associated with that. Yes, so thank you. So we've approached it a number of ways. One, one, we have increased the number of staff, and we briefed you on that last year, and we've tried to target those at areas of, of greatest pressure. The second one is looking for more innovative ways of working. Jackson mentioned things like the SPICE blog, so we've tried to look at things, and the advantage of that is not just a hopefully good service to members, but it reduces the number of inquiries coming to SPICE, so we're looking at using technology. Um, and I think staff are just working very hard. There hasn't been a noticeable spike in overtime. Uh, we're managing, fle we have a very flexible system of working, so we have highly flexible time. So for example, although we're very busy at certain times of the year, over say the summer recess, we would expect um, staff who principally service committees in the chamber to be able to draw that down. So 
we're managing fine, but it, it's obviously it's busy. But um, I think we're we're coping well at this point with the extra demands that Jackson has outlined. And the the I guess the increase in the the busyness isn't all attributed to Brexit and forthcoming legislation. It's just a part of the process of further devolution, I suppose. I think that's an important point. There's, yeah. there's, there's no doubt that obviously a lot's Brexit related, but uh, as we'll find out this afternoon, the new powers on taxation, uh, income tax, that's a, this committee obviously has been at the front of that, but there's a lot, the uh, new budget process where every committee, uh, or these, the, the, the committees with the greatest, the 10 or so committees with the greatest uh, interest in spend have had this new pre-budget process. This is also, Yes, although Brexit's a part of it, it's a very important point to register the new welfare powers. So there's an awful lot. The, the Parliament is busy anyway, and Brexit, in a sense, has been on top of that. OK, thank you. Uh, but Emma asked how much had been spent on overtime and what the impact was on flexi time. I think on flexi time, it's, 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 it's fine. I mean, we're managing. I mean, there's been no... Um, I, can give, I can write you the detail. I can't have got the actual number on overtime, but I'm pretty sure it, there's not been a noticeable spike in that. We don't actually pay much overtime. Uh, we tend to use flexi time. There are certain offices where we have to pay overtime, but by and large, we try and avoid it. Um, on, on the grounds that I prefer that over the year, people work their hours, and what we try to do is manage it through flexi. Um, and um, I'm pretty clear that we're still managing it fine through our flexi process. If you want, I can drop you a note after the meeting on the actual spend on overtime, if that would be helpful. Okay, okay, thank you. Can, can I just get, ask a couple of follow-ups to that as well? Because obviously you've described well the, the architecture and the landscape of the challenges that are going on. But has there been any review of working patterns undertaken at any stage um, by the corporate body, uh, looking at where we are now and actually whether working patterns of staff is suitable to the challenge that we currently face? Well, I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had several extended discussions about that. I don't know if you want to identify some specific uh, areas. I mean, I can say that uh, we are uh, reducing the number of uh, senior executives we've got as part of that continual review. But, Paul, do you want to...? Yeah, it's an ongoing process, I would say. I mean, yes, we've had periodic uh, reviews of senior management, for example. Um, but I think it's a constantly evolving process. So, for example, the way we use technology is an idea and I think the best way I found to do that is rather than have set piece reviews I expect all the individual teams and groups to look at how we do that um, where we've had more step change reviews if, for example when the parliament changed its sitting patterns you know we had a more formal assessment as to whether the way we deployed our staff was suitable for that um, but it tends to be uh, what we try to do is to be constantly looking ahead and <coughs> try to evolve the organization steadily in, in my experience big set piece reviews tend not to work very well in the current climate because things move on. So I, I'm, and it, as Jackson said, it's a, it's a regular dialogue we have with the corporate body as to how we work. Uh, and I'm as confident as I can be, but it's a constant challenge to try to make sure the staff group is deployed, uh, not just to meet um, new challenges, but the way members work. I mean, my observation is that, and you could confirm this, I hope that, you know, members operate in a more mobile way now using technology they operate not just from here but and not just in their constituencies but on the move so again the way we've um, for example set up um, our BIT team is to try to recognize that you know with more mobile devices um, and more capability to develop software applications in-house to support that so that's the approach we've taken convener to hope that answers your well, question. I, I, to, be, to be fair, I don't think it really did, because I wasn't so much worried about the headcount. I was more worried about, in response to the demand that's obviously there, the very th issues you've just raised yourself about um, the organisation working differently now and MSPs working in different ways. It was about really about the working patterns of people and how they are being deployed as, as much as it is about the number of people and the number of hours they're working that I was wondering whether any review had been undertaken in that particular regard. Um, well, sorry, well, I didn't answer it as well. I, what I intended to say is that's a constant. I mean, I, I think for me, the answer is not to have set piece reviews, but I expect all business areas to be constantly mindful of that. Um, and they, they do change their working patterns. Um, and, um, and that's an incremental process over time, as, as we see members of it. So uh, there haven't been it's rare that we have set piece reviews because in my experience by the time you finish them often the the world has moved on again so for me it's a it's a constant process just finally and i'm sorry colleagues for 
take a bit more longer this. You mentioned Jackson mentioned some very useful information about the additional work being undertaken by committees, about the percentage more times that they're meeting, the percentage more time that plenary is meeting. Has that information ever been published? I'm not aware of it. I think that's the first time we've made it publicly available. It was analysis I had done for this for this uh, for, for briefing the committee today. I think that's something that all members of the Parliament would find quite useful to to know about in terms of the the work that they undertake and uh, and uh, an understanding for the public as well about the additional um, hours that have been put in to make sure we get through this challenging period. Um, Alex. Yeah, um, good morning. A, a couple of questions. Uh, the first, that you know, in, in percentage terms, uh, the, the near 8% increase in running costs clearly stands out. Um, a lot of that seems to be explained by uh, yeah, the migration of the IT model uh, towards something that's cloud-based rather than on-site. Uh, I'm just wondering, is, is that, you know, are there offsets uh, in, in the IT, uh, on-site IT provision? And if so, where do they appear in the budget? Um, yes, there are. It's quite a complex move, but I think you're absolutely right. So the uh, on-site, say, there are the two areas where we'll save on-site, and this will over a number of years. One is just the amount of infrastructure, so we won't need to replace servers we'll probably keep some servers on site for security purposes but as we operate more in the cloud which is obviously just means servers elsewhere we'll, we'll we should make savings there there's also been a, a switch to having more in-house staff and then reduce contractor costs so i think our spend on um, contractors over the past three four years is is down by several hundred thousand pounds as we've employed more staff in-house so yes it's the but yes the down the up the other side of that is we're paying more on licensing costs there are they're more complex licenses and there are more of them I think there are I don't know the exact numbers but there are several hundred more licenses now in operation than there were two or three years ago and I think you'd expect that trend to continue over the next two or three years and it is you're right it's it swings and roundabouts we save in some areas and spend more in others uh, thank you uh, the second question is around security and uh, uh, can I thank Sir Paul for the uh, arranging of what was a most productive meeting with his security team uh, following some queuing issues we had uh, specifically with people attending our autism cross-party group uh, but I understand it was a, an issue that's been affecting a lot of the evening events uh, you know, during that meeting um, and whilst they are trying to mitigate it with a, a lot of measures uh, um, around around the main entrance uh, it um, became clear that there's a, an issue over not being able to use both the scanners at the same time uh, because of the space and the arrangement down there. Can I just ask if is some of the uh, the, the increase in the security budget uh, um, looking at that, or are there any plans uh, to look at that main entrance security arrangement so that people can get in here more, more speedily? Um, I, I, the uh, attack at the House of Commons in 2017 led to a fairly comprehensive additional review of security here at Holyrood, uh, I think as one consequence of that, which was obviously very visible, was the presence of uh, armed officers for the first time. Uh, it, it's obviously for the corporate body to address rather than advertise any weaknesses that there might be within the parliamentary security campus, so you'll understand why it wouldn't be wise for me to speculate or to comment, other than to say that the comprehensive review has been considered carefully by the corporate body. Uh, it's thought that we simply then agree to everything, because we're very keen that this parliament doesn't become a fortress parliament, but that it does remain accessible to the public uh, in as broad a way as is possible. Although, as was pointed out to me, the members of the corporate body are personally liable in the event anything <laughs> subsequently happens. So we take the responsibility in relation to the security of everybody on the campus incredibly seriously. Uh, but we're also mindful that changes that have to be implemented have to be implemented carefully uh, and budgeted for and over a period of time. And there are, there are quite a number that will materialise, um, some obvious, some less so. Uh, and of course, for members and staff, the most obvious immediate one will be the uh, two-point identification, which will come into play in the new year, uh, about which I think the first uh, confirmatory emails have either gone out or are just about to go out explaining uh, how that will operate. It's been being piloted in the short term. But yeah, we're mindful of the fact that it's important that we uh, don't allow the Parliament to become a fortress. Uh, the issues of security are things that have formed quite a big part of the discussion we've had in the corporate body. Uh, and there are you know, a range of things that we're going to be doing which do have a material effect over the Parliament on our budget. But it's important that we, that we do. Thank you. 
Um, a couple of supplementaries, I think it is. Patrick. Um, thanks, convener. It was actually following on from some of the issues that you'd raised um, earlier. I, I was just thinking about the Commission on Parliamentary Reform. Uh, one of the elements that came out from a recommendation with the, in, in that was the, the new committee engagement unit. I'm just wondering whether the expectation is that the budget for that will be stable from now on or will it, whether it will change as it develops into its role. And is there anything else coming out of the, the Commission on Parliamentary Reform which hasn't yet fed through into budgetary impacts, but, but which you see happening in the future? I mean, I think it is just worth saying, because not every member of this committee will necessarily have served in a committee that's now had an uh, exposure or interaction with the committee engagement unit, but it, it has been there and is working with a number of committees now uh, and was one of the big uh, recommendations of the uh, Commission on Reform. Uh, and I think that in a number of material ways, those committees it's been working with have been able to see the benefit that, they, that it's been able to provide. But Paul, do you want to comment on where that leads in terms of budget? Um, yeah, the short answer on the committee engagement, I expect it to be stable now. I think that for the, for the remainder of this session, at the very least, I expect that that's the budget you will see both in staff, staff and running costs. Um, and as, as Jackson said, it's begun, uh, I think it really kicked off in July, August of this year and has begun, it's done some good work already with the petitions committee. Um, I saw a note they did of a discussion they'd had with about a dozen members just asking what they, what their expectations were. And I thought there were some really interesting ideas from members coming out about how we could enhance it, whether it's mini <coughs> publics or various other interesting ideas. So they, they will feed through. Um, in terms of other um, commissions, uh, nothing major, but there are things, for example, as a, a recommended re recommendation review, the legislative process. So there might be a, a modest one-off cost for that. There's still the proposals around a backbench committee. I don't think any of these things are substantial, and they certainly wouldn't knock the main budget. All of those, I think, would be perfectly <coughs> capable of being resourced within existing <coughs> budgets. But you might see a specific spend attached to those. Thank you. Well, Convener, good morning uh, to, to the panel. Um, if I could um, turn to um, Schedule 3, what I'm particularly interested in is the, the, the budget bids and the budget, the indicative budget lines for future years in the context of actual outturn figures. Now, I appreciate that you won't have outturn figures, uh, you know, actual spend uh, for the financial year uh, 18 to, to, to 19. But I wonder, you know, what assurance can committee have that the, the various uh, budget lines are actually um, accurately based on previous spend? Um, I note that the contingency budget um, has reduced significantly. So where is the transparency for committee to know that you don't have unnecessary uh, headroom in other uh, budget lines? I mean, I mean it, 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 on the final point, I think last year I very specifically said to the committee that uh, I felt, or the, the corporate body felt, that the contingency uh, provision had been one that had been relied upon too much and that in the work that we did ahead of last year's submission, uh, we sought to try and uh, identify what the actual likely requirements were going to be so that we didn't just rely on contingency, which had mopped up, I think, quite a lot of unforeseen expense. So I think there is less of a contingency, but Paul, yeah. do you want to? Um, yeah, again, just on the contingency, which is a very fair point. So what we try to do, on the transparency point, which I think is fundamentally important, there are, and we say this in our report, there are two elements of the contingency. There is the half a million, which is the classic emergency in case anything completely unforeseen happens. The other bit, though, uh, quite up front, that's the other half a million is where we do have a, a range of bids against it, but we're not funding them just yet, but we'd expect that to be used over the year. In terms of the outturn against budget, that is something that we've been working on over a number of years to, to improve that. And uh, I think we're within a million pounds last year and certainly we have a target of within 2.5 percent which we're, we're meeting so I hope we can reassure the committee that actually uh, we I mean obviously in the public sector and with not having a revenue raising we always have to allow a margin for error but we get pretty close to the sort of budget we set and certainly within around two percent and that continues to be an area that I'd like to improve even further and I expect the outturn in the current year we don't have the actual figures you're right you're, you're right but again I would expect it to be at or close to 2%, if not better. Uh, and I would like to improve that further. There's a limit to where you can get, you'll know yourself. You can't 
there comes a point where you can't we can't overspend so there always has to be a little bit of margin but I hope that gives you the comfort uh, and particularly the transparency around the contingency which I think is an Im important point and we're always happy retrospectively to report to the committee on what we did use the contingency for just that you're reassured that it's not some padding it has actually got budget uh, has got bids against it it's just a prudent for example we used a fair bit last year to deal with the commission for parliamentary reform proposals um, and again, we've reported this year that, that how we use that money and how some of them are now being moved into mainland budgets, like the committee engagement unit would be the prime example. What I was uh, trying to be crystal clear or encourage uh, Sir Paul to be crystal clear about is that you haven't reduced the unnecessary padding in the contingency budget by um, inflating other budget lines, because it's you. not immediately transparent to us, you know, for today's purposes. Yeah on you know, uh, outturn figures on years gone by. I'll give you an absolute assurance that is not the case. And, and if it's further reassurance, they, this is obviously the key part of our budgeting year, but we have a very thorough interrogation from corporate body colleagues before we get this far. And, and I think Jackson and his colleagues wouldn't tolerate that. And there's a specific reason which I think Jackson's explained why this year's is half a million less. Um, and it's more what you would regard as a normal uh, contingency against our budget. And I wonder if um, uh, the panel could also uh, talk a little bit more about the um, maintenance costs and the, the long-term 25-year uh, plan um, and how, you know, committee will be able to uh, view those plans in terms of, you know, the next uh, few years, but also looking ahead to the longer term to ensure that what is planned is, is, is necessary, but also uh, proportionate. With that, yeah. I dealt partly with yeah. the security element of it. Um, there, mm -hmm. there are a number of um, sometimes these things can be quite frustrating. I think to uh, to politicians. Uh, I mean, members will obviously recall the uh, upgrade costs associated with changing the lighting in the chamber, which took place uh, a couple of years ago. And of course, it's undoubtedly the case that each of us knows of an elderly relative with a bulb that's worked since 1940 in their own kitchen and they can't understand why we have to spend the money that we had to spend changing the lighting in the Parliament. Uh, the problem, unfortunately, is that the units that we use become obsolete or legislation changes and we're no longer allowed to use those units and the manufacturer no longer supplies and updates them. Uh, but where we have changed uh, sound systems, for example, in the Chamber, or where we have changed lighting systems where we're permitted, uh, we have stored all of that and the, the equipment, I think this, these are all the terminals, the equipment in here, for example, is being sustained at the moment on the basis of spares from units that were taken out of the chamber uh, a few years ago. However, we are getting to the point where the infrastructure supporting all of that is becoming obsolete and so elements like that have to be built into the maintenance programme which are quite expensive. Uh, in addition, all the lifts in the Parliament are now ending the period where they can safely be operated without significant maintenance. Uh, and therefore, over the next three years, uh, all of the parliamentary lifts will probably during the summer recess, because it's six to eight weeks that they have to be out of maintenance for, on a rolling basis, have to be very significantly upgraded. And these things cost money too. And I know it can be quite frustrating because I think to myself, heck, it's a fairly new building. Surely the lifts don't need replaced, but I'm afraid that is the reality. And so, yes, we're very careful to try and not have things like all the telephony or all of the security or all of the lift replacements having to hit the parliamentary budget in one, bit, on one, in one go and, and phase them over time. Mm -hmm. And together with the, uh, the IT upgrades that, you know, that we're required to do, we try to manage that as best we can to ensure that it's an even process over the parliament. But we are aware of it. Uh, there's, there's no major maintenance cost that we are aware of that we are not anticipating uh, or that we haven't been planning to schedule into the uh, programme over the next three years. Yeah, and the final question, convener, is uh, turning to Schedule 1, um, where the total expenditure, um, including you know, capital charges and non-cash items, total net expenditure, we see a very um, you know, modest increase from uh, this year's approved budget to the budget bid for, for next year. But looking ahead to the indicative forecasts, we're, we're seeing um, bit bigger increases. And I just wondered if you could um, you know, give us a flavour of what's driving that. That's actually just a simple inflationary uplift. So we're just using uh, Treasury, I think GDP, 
deflator figures. So that at this stage is just a, a simple inflationary uplift. Clearly, when we come to put a proper indicative bid in next year, that will be much more broken down. So that's just a marker at this point in the process. Okay. And, you know, given that uh, public sector finances have been very challenging across uh, public sector, it's probably been a bit, bit, of, a, bit of an understatement. Um, and while you are covering letter, um, you know, it, it's not advocating for any outlandish increases. Um, I wonder if you could give an indication of, you know, wh wh where's the pain been for, 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 for this organisation? Um, where's the pain been? Uh, well, hopefully not pain, but I, I see what you mean. I think the, um, what are we not doing? I mean, there's a number of projects that we've had to um, postpone, um, even some investment in some sort of the technologies and things. So what we try to do is um, look to how we, we sort of balance it out with that. So we've deferred things, I don't know, some of the sort of TV and other upgrades and things like that. So what, what we try to do is, is look ahead and think what is affordable. So there's probably about a million and a half pounds worth of uh, projects we'd like to have done next year, but we're, we're putting off to future years. So that's how we tend to do it. Um, obviously, staff are working very hard. There's a sort of busyness about the place. And uh, so I think that's probably where I would say we've had to make choices. I think another area that's really worth pointing out, it's not in the area of pain, but I think it's about smart use of resources. The, the Parliamentary Bureau is now, um, just in the last six months, begin a much more strategic look at the way we organise business, and this is a real big help for us in trying to be more efficient in supporting that. So they're now pulling together not just the government's legislative programme, but committees, workloads, and other things. And what that enables us to do is to allocate resources more efficiently against that, so if we see pinch points coming ahead. So it's so there's partly about things we're just not doing and we're deferring, um, and partly just about the way we try and organise our resources so we've got the resources where they're most needed. So I hope that's the best Thank answer you, to your question. Yeah. Thank you. James, are you still? Yeah, sure. Um, can I ask about a point on Schedule 5 on the balance sheet? Um, under the taxpayers' equity section, um, obviously the balance sheet details the, the actual position at the end of 2018 and then projects 2019-2020. And there's a trend of the general fund, general fund um, decreasing by £17 million and the revaluation reserve increasing by £17 million. I just wondered what the background was to those trends. Derek, if you wouldn't mind on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's simply the accounting adjustments. The, uh, we revalue the building every year in, in line with RICS indices. Um, and we also have to charge depreciation on the building every year. So these are accounting adjustments. They're, they're non-cash items, but they affect the, the stated value of the building and the accounts. So the revaluation reserve going up indicates that the value of the building going up. Yeah. How does the general fund figure go down? Is that, um, <coughs> is that due to depreciation coming off? Um, it will reflect the depreciation, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, it's basically the the sort of total asset value of the, the parliament, yeah, which so it's is been written, the, the asset building. value has yeah. been written down because the depreciation has yeah. come off. Yeah. Right, OK. OK, thank you, James. Murdo. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder if I could go back to an issue Jackson touched on at the very start about MSPs' uh, pay and the budget for that. MSPs' pay is due to go up 2.3% uh, uh, next year, but the overall budget's up 3.3%. Can you just explain what the reason is for the, the, the difference in these figures? Yes, I can. Uh, obviously, there's a discrepancy between my confirming that MSP pay will go up by 2.3% and the overall increase in pay being 3.3%. Um, there's an additional £168,000 cost associated with the fact that the uh, First Minister has in the last year created an additional two Cabinet Secretaries and one more Junior Minister, so three additional Government Ministers than we had in the previous year's budget, uh, and that accounts for the overall increase beyond the 2.3% for members' pay uh, to bring it up to 3.3%. So it's an additional £168,000 attributed to those additional costs arising from additional ministers. Okay, th th thank you for that. I, I, this is quite interesting because I'd, I'd always understood that 
MSPs pay would come out of the SPCB budget, but it's also the case that ministers' pays come out of the same budget. I would have thought that came out of the Scottish Government budget. Um, it's always been this way. It's right. partly just the way the Scotland Act is set up. So this isn't new. This is it's always been the case. Okay, thank you. And is this the highest ministerial salary bill we've ever had? That's not something I've looked to, to confirm, <laughs> Mr. Fraser. Uh, but I, I suspect it might be on the basis that it's the highest MSP salary bill we've had too. I don't think uh, costs decline; they invariably increase. But I think it probably is the biggest compliment of ministers we've ever had. So I think it probably, if one was to establish uh, from the record, would confirm that to be the case. But I can't. I can only speculate on that. I don't have that. It's not a hand. chart we maintain. I think it would be interesting for the committee to know. Well, I'm sure the committee would enjoy finding out. <laughs> thank you. Tom. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. It's just one or two very quick questions. Um, reference was made to Brexit uncertainty, and I haven't checked Twitter in the last half hour, so I don't entirely know about that at the moment. <laughs> um, however, I just wonder, in terms of the contingencies that have been uh, planned for, what consideration has been given to the possibility of a new deal, a no deal rather, and particularly we have a number of EU nationals who work as uh, part of parliamentary staff, as well as being employed by MSPs, their status would be up in the air in that scenario. So I wonder how in terms of scenario planning for a no deal has informed the budgetary process. Well, I'm sure Paul will comment further, but can I say that the corporate body has acted in a completely apolitical way in regard to this. No deal has always been one of the options as a responsible body that we have considered, along with seeking to do the best we can, uh, at very often in the absence of any firm uh, information, which I happily concede we have to deal in that environment. It certainly was one of the considerations when we set the budget before the committee last year. We recognised it was something of an open window uh, and we've been having to, and of course the Parliament itself is now having to deal with the actual uh, progression of SSIs and SIs that are beginning to arise as a consequence of it. Uh, my understanding is that we've actually done a, we feel we've done a pretty good job of anticipating this at the moment, and uh, the uh, members of the staff who have been deployed specifically to try and ensure we get this right have accommodated everything that's had to happen, and I don't think they've been surprised by anything at all yet, but I know that no deal is one of the scenarios that we look at Paul? Yeah, no, it's just really just to confirm that. So we have a mm. specific team which is scenario planning, as you say, all the time as things uh, develop, including no deal. Uh, and we're confident that this budget has sufficient in it. So part of the contingency would enable us to do that, or we would flex other things to focus, and it would obviously be a top priority. Um, your point on uh, EU nationals is well made. We're really following the same approach as the government. You know, we're reassuring both my own staff, but obviously through our contractors, contractor staff. Um, to give them every support we can to ensure that, you know, through whatever deal is, is ultimately agreed, that their position is as secure as it can be and offering them reassurance and advice as we go along. Thank you very much. My second question is a different topic. The uh, Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee this week published its report on, on cross-party groups. We are now somewhere north of 100 cross-party groups. I believe there are now more cross-party groups in the Parliament than there are um, MSPs who are either not party leaders or members of the government. Um, has any consideration been given in terms of the budgeting process to ensuring that there's adequate facilities made available so that all of these cross-party groups can be accommodated? As I'm sure all members are aware, they're often very well attended and there's a great demand, but sometimes there can be challenges in terms of accessing facilities. Um, yes, yeah, so well, as a Member of Parliament, I have noted the same growth in cross-party groups, and I know that the committee itself was supposedly undertaking an evaluation and a more rigorous assessment uh, on the creation of new uh, cross-party groups. The corporate body does not fund uh, or support financially cross-party groups at all. Uh, we provide accommodation costs, uh, but we don't provide any support beyond that. So it's not really, I think, something we've had to make sig any significant bu budgetary provision oh, for. I, I appreciate that. It was with regards to cross-party groups, I should have clarified meeting off campus but due to a lack of availability within oh, right. the Parliament, if that is something that has been considered in terms of supporting cross-party groups to meet off campus. No, it hasn't, and I'd be quite reluctant. I mean, the, the, the strength of cross-party groups is that they can be formed as and when. The minute we officially get involved is we have to have some kind of regulation or control, and I don't think that would be... I think that would go against the uh, 
There's no expense incurred for a cross-party group to meet within the Parliament. However, if the committee rooms, for example, or other rooms are unavailable, they would necessitate the meeting yeah. off-campus for that expense, as I understand, would be incurred by the cross-party group. Has any consideration been given for parliamentary support to provide additional facilities off-campus? We've, we've not been asked, but I, I would personally remain reluctant to do that. I think it crosses the... We begin then to become a funder, essentially, of those groups. They can use this facility because it exists already, and you know the the marginal extra cost of meeting an entry room is quite quite low. I, I feel there's something particularly valuable about cross-party groups, which is part of the fact that they're not, in a sense, controlled as part of the formal machinery. And I think I'd be extremely cautious about moving into that space. We, we do everything we possibly can, of course, within this facility to make it possible for them to meet. We will leave equipment out, etc. So. That's the balance we try to strike. I've not actually been approached directly on that, and it would be a matter for the corporate body. We may have done. Maybe your memory is better than yeah. mine. It would be a matter for the corporate body, but I, to be honest, I'd be quite reluctant to, to go there, even though I'm sympathetic. I, I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely just trying to remember. I, I think we may have, I, oh, and I may be right or wrong about this, but I think we might have received one request or one, or, mm. or might have been informal or not. We've received no formal request from uh, members or groups of members or cross-party groups that I can think of beyond possibly that one that's just in my mind. Um, and so the answer to your question is no, the corporate body hasn't given any due consideration to that. Um, it, obviously, if requested to do so, we would. Uh, but I think it's also true to say that the corporate body members are usually very reluctant to set precedents. Uh, and there are a number that are being set. Obviously, set. obviously, we've had a very considerable precedent set in relation to uh, the implementations for additional security costs at members' offices, which we've had to look at very carefully and decide what we thought was appropriate or not in relation to that. So we can be quite circumspect before we would agree to anything, but we haven't formally been asked to. So, uh, of course, if we are formally asked to, we would formally review. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I don't think there's any other questions from members, so I can thank the representatives of the corporate body for their evidence taken session today. Very helpful. Obviously, your evidence will form part of our budget report. Um, when we publish that uh, towards the end of January. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're just, I'm just going to push on to the, to the next business. The next item on our agenda is to consider a negative statutory instrument in relation to Revenue Scotland sharing information with the Welsh Revenue Authority, the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Act 2014 Auxiliary Provisions Order, 2018 SSI 2018 Oblique 346. Uh, do members have any questions or any comments? There are no members' questions and no members' comments. In that case, we now move into private session.